So I studied computer science, and uh, this means that I spend all my days uh, in this gray, dim-lit computer lab writing code, which I love, I really do. It's just that I'm also secretly a little bit arty-farty, and a computer lab is maybe not the most poetically inspiring environment. I used to think so anyway, but I decided to turn computer science into my muse, and if you recognize yourself at all in my story, I think that you will find similar inspiration in your own course. Okay, so when I was a kid, back in primary school, I was pretty intense. I discovered early on that whenever I did some completely over-the-top artistic gimmick for an assignment, the teachers would light up with a delighted smile. So if I were to do a two-page essay about the French Revolution, it was perfectly normal for my 12-year-old self to paint an oil painting of Marie Antoinette just to have it on the cover sheet. It was that kind of stuff. And I became completely addicted to the validation it gave me to see people mesmerized about information. And there really was no limit to the amount of work I was prepared to put in in order to feel this rush. But I discovered in high school that for some reason things no longer worked that way. I remember an essay that I'd written about landscape painting that I had illustrated throughout and at the end I'd kind of visualized the structure of the essay as a map through a landscape because it was about landscape painting and I thought it was so clever. And I handed in this essay like an overexcited puppy, hoping that the teacher would drop his jaw and pat my smug little head. But instead he looked at it with almost disgust and said, this essay, it's a bit narcissistic, isn't it? And I mean, he didn't, I knew he didn't mean anything bad at all with these words, but they sent shockwaves through me because I would never thought of what I loved doing as something vain or self-indulgent, as, as a waste of resources. But it was true that out there, people were learning advanced mathematics and using algorithms to analyze data. And there I was sitting, pretending to be poetic about information. Now, the more I think about this, the more absurd it becomes, because we don't, you know, we don't criticize Stone Age people for pretentiously carving into mammoth bone and not hurrying up inventing agriculture or something. So we shouldn't criticize ourselves for being artsy. But if ever I was a narcissist, I was certainly cured because I wanted to go to university to study something that was as no nonsense as it possibly could be. And there was nothing less poetic than a computer program, I thought, incorrectly. But while at university, I was still my primary school self, I still tried these essay visualization gimmicks. And the grade was always a C and the verbal feedback always along the lines of WTF. So I realized, I realized I had to find other outlets for my weird compulsion for artsy gimmickry. So I thought, dating. Now, in the first year, there was this guy, right? <laughs> we, we, would always, we would always stumble upon each other on campus, and we would always smile awkwardly. But we would never speak, never introduce ourselves. And it went on for ridiculously long. And it's really, really hard not to develop a dangerous crush under those circumstances. So inevitably, I did. And in contemplating whether or not to ask him out, I became very fascinated with the nature of patterns. As in, were our constant collisions coincidental? Or did he intentionally try to get my attention? Did he change his whereabouts depending on mine? Did I change my whereabouts depending on his? Well, a little bit, maybe. <laughs> was, it, was it statistically significant, or did I, heaven forbid, read this beautiful pattern into random noise? And so in computer science, we have our own way of thinking about patterns. We think of patterns as any information that can be compressed, anything that isn't random. So for example, um, a long string of repeating ones and zeros can be compressed into a tiny little computer program that generates it. A data set can be compressed into an equation. Observations of a guy on campus can be compressed into a predictive model of whether or not I will meet my crush today. Not that I would ever do such a model. I swear. <laughs> a poetic metaphor is an act of information compression because you take the descriptions of two concepts and you describe one of them in terms of the other so that the brain only needs to store one description, which is why we love them so much and find metaphors so beautiful. And so inspired by this cute little whirling dance of mutual stalking, I decided I would ask him out without ever having spoken to him by sending him a cipher, because I thought it would be like a poetic metaphor for our cryptic communication. And, uh, 
And when he said yes, I was again this overexcited puppy jumping around my dorm room. And we dated for a bit, but it turned out he didn't quite fancy me back. So I thought we could be friends instead. And because it felt like the one rational thing to do, I thought I would send him one last gimmick. And um, it was a short story exploring the theme of information compression. And it was, it was meant to serve the same kind of purpose as that cute slash creepy card scene at the end of Love Actually. Like, hey, I'm cool. We could be artsy friends instead. Except my own attempt at embracing the friend zone rom-com style, it wasn't quite as successful because I discovered after a week that he hadn't even read the story. He hadn't even opened it. And I don't necessarily judge him for this because I cringe violently to this day. But not only had I managed to severely underestimate his indifference towards me, it was also clear that he wasn't as, as mesmerized by information compression as I had expected. He wasn't, he wasn't mesmerized at all, actually. And I had read Signal into Noise in the most mortifying way, and at the time, I reacted to this with intense guilt and pain, because I was pouring my heart into these poetic gimmicks, and all he did was just weirding people out. And it marked the beginning of a very dark time for me, where I just loathed myself as this pretentious source of discomfort, when all I wanted to do was just excite people. And it, it, was, it was followed by a string of other heartbreaks, and in part, I think, and I was informed last week, actually, that apparently you're supposed to play it cool, and like, I had no idea about this, but also, but also because I, I couldn't stop deluding myself. I couldn't stop finding meaningful patterns in, in relationships where there was no poetry to be found. But as I sat listening to all of these like fierce, independent woman heartbreak anthems, I'm talking sheer, I'm talking Destiny's Child, Kelly Clarkson is good for these things. I began to think, maybe it takes a narcissist to remain sane. Maybe, maybe the best part about making a complete fool of yourself, and this is incidentally the only good part about making a complete fool of yourself, and it's really not that much of a consolation, is that you, um, you stop being afraid of cringing at yourself in hindsight. So you find the courage to invest in these crazy delusional creative projects because you know that if you're lucky, you have time to create something of lasting value before the unpoetic reality catches up with you. And so in second year, to heal my aching self, and also because uh, I was still really obsessed with information compression, I started this weird blog. It was about a surrealistic museum, um, a physical memory palace, if you will, that took abstract concepts, so abs concepts from information theory, from computer science, and it exhibited them as if they were concrete objects. So essentially, the blog served to visualize the most beautiful metaphors that I had come across during my heartbroken readings in information theory. And uh, it contained a few stories about information compression as well, because uh, I was petty and I couldn't help myself. But, um, and because a metaphor, remember, is an act of information compression, which is why we love them so much. And at its peak, this blog was visited daily by approximately my dad and my dad only. Because I, I, think, I think he thought that boosting my Google Analytics would cheer me up, and, and it did. And as I felt my depression lift, I became more attentive to people around me. And I would often sit with my course mates and listen to when they improvised these beautiful, clever metaphors to explain some algorithm, some computational concept to me or to someone else. And I would think, these metaphors, they are precious goods. They are nothing shy of Shakespearean. We need to preserve them. We need to save them from ephemerality so that they don't go lost as your mental imagery fades away so that the next year students would have to rediscover them because what a waste that would be. So you can imagine my primary school self having a heroic Clark Kent moment here, realizing that all of this information compression nonsense could finally come in handy. Because we all know the experience of revising before exams. You are given this uninspired PowerPoint, this long, unstructured sequence of never-ending bullet points that you're somehow supposed to squeeze into your brain. And what you do is that you slowly begin to mentally cross-connect them. You perceive correspondences, you abstract patterns, you twist and transform, and you declutter and you organize, and you hammer it. 
dent by dent into something compressed enough that you can carry inside your brain as you walk into the exam hall, all of this raw information just neatly folded into this inflatable memory palace that you can just blow up and navigate around. And then, when the exam is over, we just walk out, forget about it, throw our notes in the trash, and it's like every year we write poetry on the shoreline and the end of the semester just washes it away. Now, in my experience, there are four different steps to information compression. And you may not do these externally, you may not do, do them on paper, but I can guarantee that you do them mentally. And remember that what you see as revision notes, a computer scientist sees as a data structure with very particular mathematical properties when it comes to how efficiently they store and compress information. So the first thing that we do is this really free-form network of connected concepts. It's, um, it's not unlike the one I did for my high school essay, actually. And our brains are not really fond of these because it's really just one big tangle. But it's a good way to start. And what we do next is that we use these concepts to um, collapse concepts into more abstract ones. So we can build up these layers of increasing abstraction, which we could organize as this tree-like structure that you may recognize as a mind map. We all do mind maps. And our brains really like these because you can start at a particular location, the most general concept, and you can travel systematically down to explore every node. And even though mind maps are really nice, it's still not an optimal way of structuring or compressing information before exams. Because in, inside an exam, you want your brain to be, be like a slot machine. You just see an exam problem, and you can immediately locate the answer to that problem inside your memory palace. So what we do is that we look into previous exam papers, and again, we try to find patterns. We try to extract a set of variables along which we can characterize exam questions so that in principle we could consider all of the possible combinations of these characteristics and in theory um, map out the entire space of all possible exam questions. But then um, we realize that we have social lives, again theoretically speaking, uh, so we, we have to use these hints and cues to try to figure out which exam problems are likely to come up and focus on these. And even though our knowledge, our information is now optimally structured, we still have the concepts themselves to compress. And to, to compress a concept is to find a suitable metaphor in our memory. But our memory is a big, big palace to fumble randomly around on your own. So we are wise to collaborate in this compression, to collaborate in the search for metaphors, to crowdsource the poetry, if you will. So what I would do in third year was that I would take a course, so PowerPoint upon PowerPoint of never-ending bullet points, and I would structure, compress the information as this tree-like structure so as to approximately enumerate all possible exam questions. And I would zoom in on the, on the concepts themselves, and um, I would try to find a visual metaphor so as to summarize them, and sometimes do a more poetic interpretation of it as well, because it's a good way to attract attention. Now, I'm aware that these reek with romantic frustration, but oh well. Um, here are some more examples. And I would do them in black and white because it would be cheap to print out at the university printers. And I would distribute them to my course mates and make them available to next year's cohort. And all of a sudden, I wasn't this pathetic, overexcited puppy anymore, you know, panting proudly over having done something not so clever. Because my, my inbox was filled with encouraging mail from peers, professors, and university staff. And it would make me think, what if universities systematically encouraged this? That every cohort would take the course material and leave it in a more compressed and tidier state than when they started. So that over time, the explanations for the concepts would be incrementally improved upon and evolve into these more poetic, beautiful, and gimmicky formats. Now, I may be incorrect, but I think that everyone here is secretly a little bit artifarty. And uh, I hope that you don't patronize yourself for that or think of yourself as a useless narcissist. Because even though you may not enjoy drawing, you may not enjoy writing, as long as you enjoy the search for a good metaphor, you are an asset to your classmates, your course, your education, presumably romantically not very successful, but hey, whatever, whatever. <laughs> because imagine, 
an education where the teacher didn't point at you in front of all others and said, hey you, what's the answer to this question? But instead pointed at you and said, hey, how do you imagine this? In your mind's eye, what does this concept look like? Your inner world, the pictures it paints and the poetry it pens, it all matters. With information, you can go on to do great things, but even for something as unromantic as computer science, the mind is the final recipient of the information, and what the mind desires isn't bits. It's beauty. Thank you.